in partnership, and I apologize, um, in partnership with the Commission on Housing Affordability, put in two fiscal requests, uh, one for $50 million for tax credit funded projects. Uh, this will be gap financing in the form of a revolving loan. It will run through the existing structure of the Oling Walker Board. Uh, the second is $50 million toward the uh, rehabilitation or construction of housing in rural Utah. And we have defined that as counties of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth class, as well as uh, cities and towns under 10,000 in counties of the second class. So there seems to be quite a bit of support for this. And we're just looking forward to the session and, and hopefully it'll get, get the funding that has been requested. Well, this is awesome, Christina. And I know that you also know a little bit more about the other appropriations as well, what's coming out of the commission bill. So hopefully the other panelists will be able to join us. Um, Christina, as far as, so as far as advocacy and outreach, what do you think will be the best strategy in asking our members to reach out to their legislators to support this request? Yeah, you know, I think that any outreach in support of these two fiscal notes is of utmost importance. The way that we've really structured it is uh, all of you, of course, are aware that Wayne Niederhauser also has some homeless funds, some supportive services, um, housing and, ho and homeless funds in the governor's budget, which is amazing. And the way that we look at it is really a pendulum, uh, uh, like a, a life cycle. So <laughs> Wayne's funds are really targeted at the 40% and below uh, area median income. And the funds that we are requesting are a little bit different, but they span that 60 or 40 in some cases down to 30 up to um, the 80% AMI out in rural Utah. So what does that look like? Let's talk a little bit about this tax credit funding. You'll hear it referred to as private activity bond gap financing. But it really is, we're trying to change that nomenclature. It's for tax credit projects. So this mm -hmm. gap financing can be utilized for 9% credits, LIHTC credits. And if you're familiar with those, those are the lower income threshold, the 30% and below. A lot of that debt financing carries a higher percentage. We would love to be able to assist um, developers in increasing the number of units that they're able to provide by offering them a significantly lower interest rate. In the write-up that I produced, uh, my proposed interest rates are anywhere from 0.5 to 1%. Uh, we'll go through a rules process, of course, and, and public outreach on both of these fiscal notes. Uh, so, so there will be ample opportunity for everyone to be included. Um, so, so that PAB, so the tax, sorry, I keep referring to it as PAB, the tax credit funded or fund is extremely important. Let me just illustrate what happened at a private activity bond board meeting back in um, a couple months ago. We had just over a hundred million dollars left of private activity bond to allocate and we had three times the number of uh, dollars requested. If we had the entire private activity bond allocation, again, that's you know through the IRS, it's not something we can control. We could have authorized private activity bond funding for 2,000 more units. Um, so what, we, uh, what we're reviewing, quite frankly, is how do we reduce that private activity bond request to the minimum of the 50% of the um, project financing so that we can spread the private activity bonds hopefully a little bit further, maybe we'll be able to capture one more new project, maybe we'll be able to capture two, but we will have the flexibility with this money to create a reserve fund for those projects that come in and they are right on the 50% mark if there's increases in their uh, costs. This fund can provide sort of a cushion to enable those projects to continue to move forward. And if you're not familiar with the, the the 4% credits, you don't, you're not able to access 4% credits unless you have the private activity bonding allocation. So it's really important that we spread out the allocation as much as possible to get access to those 4% credits to our developers. 
Um, that being said, on both sides of the equation, the 9% and the 4%, we will uh, work with developers in each, in each uh, bucket, if you will, to see if we can't provide lower financing rates for them so they can increase the number of units in their projects. So that would be fabulous. Um, the second, the rural outreach piece will be as soon as the funds, cross our fingers, as soon as the funds are allocated, the parameters of what will happen with those funds will be community driven. So we will be working very closely with the uh, AOGs to gather interested parties to decide exactly what these funds could be used for. There are a number of ideas this money can be subscribed, has been subscribed to, you know, four or five times over. There's such a drastic need for workforce housing in rural Utah. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the issues in Moab and Washington County, but it's not just the ones that grab the news headlines that we are interested in. It's the smaller communities, it's Ivan's, it's Tory, it's, it, it just, it's broad spectrum. So these funds will assist uh, primarily, we're hoping uh, to target some of the funds for municipal workers, teachers, firefighters, police out in these rural areas are really struggling to find any place even to rent. So hopefully we can make a dent in that and, and it really is, it's not a lot of money, quite frankly, I have a feeling that it'll go quick quickly and we'll be back next year at the session asking for additional monies. And again, these are also revolving loan funds and uh, any support that you can provide, it's a worthwhile cause, we appreciate it. Christina, that is so wonderful. And from our perspective, um, this is a significant amount of money based on what has been received in the previous years. It's definitely not enough. Uh, looking at the whole housing crisis that we're seeing in the state. And among the participants uh, today, we, we do have um, affordable housing developers. Um, so if you have any questions for Christina relating this issue, you can put in a Q&A or you can raise your hand and ask the question directly to Christina. Um, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna welcome Wendy the Hauser. Welcome to our meeting. Uh, we are not live on YouTube because I had to stop it. We had some uh, technical difficulties. So I know I um, recording the meeting. I'm probably gonna edit it because it was not fun uh, trying to figure out all that. So uh, Mr. Wendy the Hauser is the homeless service coordinator for the state of Utah. Former Senate president. We welcome you here, and um, we would like to hear about your amazing work uh, that you've been doing since you have been appointed and also the uh, financial request in the governor's budget for deeply affordable housing. Welcome. Thank you, Francesca. I guess everybody can hear. Uh, I uh, got into this position probably, it's been about eight, nine months ago and made a, uh, a big, I, my effort was to understand what was going on. Um, I've been a policymaker, <clears throat> deal with uh, these issues at a high level, but I can tell you that the <clears throat> realities of, of um, chronic homelessness in particular, um, I didn't really understand to a large degree, <clears throat> excuse me, and so uh, I actually do quite a bit of outreach uh, on a weekly basis. I've gotten familiar with a community of people who are experiencing homelessness in the Salt Lake area. Uh, I've been able to <clears throat> make friends with them, talk with them, hear their stories. And so when I talk about homelessness, I, I, I do it not from a data point of view, but from experience and having actually talked to people who are in that situation. And I can tell you that, um, that there are really two subpopulations to the term homelessness. And I think you could break it down even further, but I'm gonna uh, talk about two main subpopulations and uh, housing is a critical element to both. The first subpopulation is acute or situational homelessness. 
these are people that um, are functioning very well, or at least reasonably well in society, uh, but they are living on the edge of their income and housing uh, costs are, are going up and, um, and probably much faster than wages are, <laughs> which is a, a definite problem. And, and so what a lot of these individuals and families face, especially when there's been a crisis, like a health incident. And you know most health plans today have uh, very high deductibles. Um, you know, somebody can end up with, even with insurance, a $20,000, $30,000 bill when there's been a big health incident. Uh, they may be out of work. Maybe this is a person that's had COVID, a serious situation with COVID, a uh, lot of different situations, dot, dot, dot. And they find themselves not being able to make their payment, uh, whether it's rent or a house payment, there's a foreclosure, there's an eviction. And now this individual or family are facing homelessness. And, and most uh, um, people are able to uh, self-recover because they have some family or community support. Um, and, uh, but there are some that, that lack that support that may end up in the shelter. Uh, but we are very pretty successful as a system getting people back into housing uh, that are faced with these situations or these acute issues. Um, that's one population. The other population is what I call the chronic homeless. And this is not as about, it's not really about housing, uh, except that they need housing. <laughs> it's about the mental and behavioral health issues that they face. And we're talking about people that have experienced some pretty <laughs> heinous uh, trauma in their life. This is intergenerational poverty. This is domestic violence. Uh, this is re-entry from incarceration. Um, this is aging out of foster care. And we could probably mention a couple of other uh, reasons. Uh, and there are probably many um, maybe sub reasons under all those major categories, but people end up in homelessness having suffered some fairly deep trauma in their life. And, and I'm just gonna give you an example that we know very well in our society because it's been made very apparent. <clears throat> and that is, and I think this still goes on, but, and, uh, uh, but we, I think we figured this out pretty well in our society and it's the opioid crisis. So 10 years ago or even longer ago, um, individuals that may have faced a knee operation, well, we'll just use a knee operation for an example, a knee replacement, um, <clears throat> very painful. Um, I, I've not experienced it, so I know the pain, but I'm just uh, hearing a lot about how that recovery can be very painful. Uh, they're prescribed opioids and, and then uh, get addicted to those opioids, trying to mitigate their pain. Um, and, and, and this has actually been a source of, of homelessness <laughs> to a large degree. You get addicted to a substance like that. Uh, you do anything you can to get that substance. Um, and this has affected families. Uh, uh, it's uh, added to our homeless situation over the years. Um, probably uh, many of these individuals have gotten into heroin um, or some other drug to mitigate the, that physical pain. When I'm talking about trauma though, we're talking about abuse, um, all kinds of abuse that people have faced in their life. Uh, and, 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 and there's a huge spectrum of issues, but it's, it's pain, it's just not physical pain. And that pain has been masked or mitigated um, um, 
by um, by drugs, heroin, meth, and other uh, drugs. Uh, and I'm not talking about specific situations, but just, I'm talking generally. Um, and and so uh, this this pain that they've experienced uh, through their trauma, now they find themselves homelessness and in a cycle they can't get out of, be mainly because of addiction, um, but it could be mental health issues. Um, and until they can appropriately deal with those sub trauma issues, that pain that the, that's got them to where they are uh, through intergenerational poverty or whatever it may be, um, they're not going to be able to ever get out of that cycle. And, and we know that housing is an important element to that because nobody can heal from any kind of pain or trauma that they've faced in life um, unless they can, unless they're in a stable housing situation. And, uh, I think it rarely happens uh, in a congregate shelter uh, or living on the streets, but not very often. And so, you know, our objective uh, in society is to get people in the best situation possible. We're not trying to create dependency. We're trying to create opportunity uh, for them to uh, address those issues. And the best possible place for that is in a stable housing situation. So knowing all that and having discovered a lot of, uh, of that information as the state homeless coordinator, I could see that we're going to need a big um, uh, a big pot of money to deal with afford deeply affordable housing. Um, when we're talking about um, acute or situational, that could be deeply, but uh, I think once people get back in a job, we're talking 60% AMI, um, maybe above that if they have a, uh, a if they can get a, a decent job that pays uh, enough uh, to get them up to those higher um, AMIs. But when we're talking about chronic homelessness, we're talking about a very challenged revenue stream. Unless somebody's on social security or disability or has some kind of a revenue stream. And, um, and we're going to have to uh, subsidize that quite heavily in order for that to work. And, and I also, um, this is one of my sound bites that, uh, that I, I always put out there is case managed housing is sustainable and successful housing for chronic homelessness. And unless it's case managed though, with these wraparound services, with people that care actually, that are willing to build relationships and help these individuals, uh, without that, housing is not successful. I know a lot of people on the street, I've talked with them, they've been in housing multiple times. They've been through drug treatment multiple times and it hasn't worked for them. They, and, and in a lot of ways they've lost hope uh, because they've been through that and have failed. And how do we get them feeling more positive about themselves, being willing to address those underlying issues, those traumas, um, let's get them into a stable housing situation. But we also have to provide this case management, this relationship, uh, this uh, wraparound, the wraparound services um, with that housing, because housing alone will not uh, solve the problem. So, you know, our objective with this uh, 128 million is to provide comp uh, uh, a competitive grant process to um, to developers, private um, nonprofit organizations, to create more uh, deeply affordable housing that's case managed, and we're hoping that by buying down an otherwise um, uh, debt stack that they might have on an acquisition, and maybe getting it to a debt free situation that those revenue streams could be uh, freed up to help not only manage the property, but manage the people in the property. And, and so that's kind of a high level objective. 
We're still trying to work out the details. One of the challenges that we face is the revenue stream from the rents are, are, are a challenging situation. And so making it all work financially is very difficult, but we're hoping to uh, work with uh, the community of, of housing providers uh, to uh, work out those details and, um, and get the legislature to pass that. So we ask for your help to at least get that pot of money uh, available to us. I'm very bullish that we can get that, uh, that money and it's ARPA funds. So there are some restrictions to that. Like you can't pay off debt and, and, and there are some other restrictions. Uh, and so Francesca, that's kind of the, uh, it's not really, it's kind of a big nutshell, uh, a lot of explanation, but uh, if you want me to add, answer some questions, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, well, thank you so much, first of all, because, um, you know, um, there are a lot of, you know, social uh, services providers on the meeting. So um, like somebody asked me for your email contact because I'm sure they have, you know, their uh, stories to share. Also, I want to uh, share something that Kelly Romer said. Uh, Kelly is with Solid County Aging Services. And what she wants to say is that I would like to add a note regarding the cute group Mr. Niederhausen mentioned. We also have people on fixed incomes who have no possibility of income increases. Uh, which will match the rate at which rents are going up. Seniors, people with disabilities on SSI. The inventory of housing set aside for that population has not increased as far as she's aware. So this is, you know, um, affordable senior housing projects, which it's, a, you know, another um, issue to deal with. Um, I know a question came from uh, Nick Fritz, was for Christina. I want to raise a question for you, sir. Yeah, again, Jeannie Hagen says, what's being done to help our senior population afford housing on a fixed income? And that's a really great question, Jeannie. Um, but the good part about that is there's a revenue stream and with, with, uh, with the disability income. And uh, with a revenue stream, I think we can, we can get there with this fund, with these funds. But we're talking about creating housing that really doesn't have any debt on it, um, and and that and that extra funds that would be paying normally paying off a loan would be going to case management. Um, but there are there are a number of permanent supportive housing uh, projects out there that have that scenario, but are still challenged because of the rent flow. And so I believe that. Some of these high needs um, housing, especially for those that, um, that have a disability income or social security income, those will really work well with this program. Um, and uh, because probably a lot of those may be more in the acute or situational, may not need the case management, uh, but for the population that does, if they have those revenue streams, uh, it's going to make it the housing a lot easier. It's going to make the, us. It's going to make uh, our ability to make that housing work uh, much easier. Yeah. So I mean, the the um, the conversation must continue in the sense of this needs. Uh, require participation from Olin Walker Housing Loan Fund, from the Utah Housing Corporation, also the senior housing as a specific uh, part of money. So it's definitely one of the top issues at the Utah Housing Coalition on our radar. Um, Christina, I'd like to ask you, there are a couple of questions for you in the chat. Would you like to answer them now or would you like to answer them in the end? Um, Representative Waldrop's here, so perhaps we okay. can get the microphone. Okay. Well, Representative Waldrop, you're on. Welcome. So uh, Christina provided a, an update on the financial um, uh, request in the governor's bu uh, budget. And Mr. Niederhauser uh, spoke about his request for deeply affordable housing. So uh, I invited you to this meeting to give us an update um, on the bill that uh, um, is getting drafted right now coming from the Utah Commission on Housing Affordability. 
Thank you, Franciscan. Thanks for uh, giving me some time to be here. And, and uh, thanks to Form Center Niederhauser and Christina. They're uh, carrying heavy loads on, on these issues and they're not easy issues to solve. Um, you know, they're really challenging and, and we try to find um, uh, not just um, financial levers that we can dump money into, but also policy levers that we can pull that will make the financial investments that we're making uh, more worthwhile and more um, uh, impactful. And so that's what we're trying to do in the Commission on Housing Affordability Bill. Um, we are um, looking at a few different things. Number one, um, we're trying to encourage the um, adoption of uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, internal ADUs. Last year, there was a bill passed by Representative Ward that uh, gave um, the rights to individuals to to create internal um, accessory dwelling units. And uh, one of the things that's happened is some municipalities are charging impact fees as if they were additional uh, structures being built, which is not the reality. They're all internal to an existing structure. So part of the bill will remove those um, impact fees uh, from uh, any ADUs throughout the state. Um, the bill will also do one thing I think that's really critical. One of the hard things we're faced with right now is understanding what our inventory is in affordable housing. Uh, what do we have? Where is it? Uh, when is it going to go from affordable housing to market rate housing? Is there a, you know, is there a, a, a time limit on that affordable housing that it's going to um, fall off of those roles? Do we have other affordable housing in the pipeline? We don't have that data on a statewide basis. Some communities are tracking that well, uh, some are not, but even for those that are tracking it, we just, we, we aren't able to see that on a statewide basis. So uh, one of the things that uh, Christine is going to get to do is um, create a statewide database of affordable housing. And that's part of this bill. There's funding for it. And um, we will require also all of the municipalities in their annual reporting on affordable housing to document in a very structured way what they have, you know, answering those same questions so that we can create this meaningful state database so that we understand where we're sitting um, relative to, uh, you know, what the need is. And right now we just don't have a clear picture on that. Um, so that's gonna be a critical piece of it. And that will also flow into what, uh, uh, Chair Niederhauser is doing with, with his group because that's going to be a part of that reporting is looking at what we're doing, I think on homelessness as well and, and just trying to get our arms around what, um, what, our, what our resources are. Um, go to the next thing on that bill. Uh, we will be looking at um, a couple of other things. Um, one is creating a revolving loan fund for rural Utah. And I don't know if Christine already talked about that. Did that, did that already get covered by Christina, Francisca? Yes. Okay, good. Um, you know, there's, there's some critical things that we need to do that are different in rural Utah than they are on the Wasatch Front. So I'm, you know, I think that's important that we're looking at that from the rural standpoint as well. Um, the other thing that, that I think is critical that we'll need to do, and it may be in the Commission on Housing Affordability Bill, it may be in a separate bill, and that is to create a measuring stick. Uh, the, other, the other tool that we don't have right now is some sort of measuring stick to say, okay, what is each community's fair share of affordable housing? Are they meeting their fair share? Are they exceeding their fair share? Do they not have uh, sufficient um, housing to meet their fair share. And so the proposal will be to take the total number of public employees in the state of Utah and use that as the measuring stick to determine um, what a community's fair share is. Um, there won't be any penalties with this, but we just, we, we have to have some method of measuring how we're doing uh, city by city and community by community. So uh, let's say that 5% of and I'm just throwing out a number because I don't have a number, but let's just say 5% of, of Utah's population is a public employee, then that would be the state's requirement for affordable housing would be that percentage. And then we can apply that percentage to any community. So we can go to Salt Lake City and say, okay, you've got, you know, let's say you got 100,000 residents, uh, you need 5% of your 
um, residents need to have access to affordable housing. So you need uh, affordable housing for 5,000 um, you know, individuals. And, and that will start to give us an idea uh, along with the reporting we're getting and this data that we're getting now, we can now we can link that data to some sort of a measure of who's doing their part in you know which cities are doing their part and which cities are deficient. And then we can develop tools um, that will encourage the cities that aren't doing their fair part to you know either do it or help contribute to other cities who are doing their fair part. And and you know it gets a little bit interesting because you don't want to necessarily have affordable housing up far away from public transit on a bench somewhere. Um, you want to have that affordable housing in those transportation corridors around um, the, uh, you know, the public transit options, uh, whether it be bus rapid transit or um, uh, front runner or tracks. Um, so, so there's, you know, it, we can't just say, oh, every community has to build this. It, it may make sense to put more density in certain locations than in other locations um, so that we have um, the, you know, the second piece to affordability in, in life, and that's transportation. Um, so that's something that we'll look at over the course of the next year as we start to gather this data and as, as we have something to measure against uh, what we're currently doing. So um, that's another piece that, uh, you know, that we're looking at. Um, and in addition to that, we're also working on uh, affordable housing share. I don't know if Christina talked about this in uh, like point of the mountain development. Uh, we want to have them have uh, up to 20% of their housing be affordable or attainable um, and have, you know, different income level targets they're shooting for in those uh, large developments there. And then also with UTA, same idea, make sure that when we're developing state projects that as a part of the conversion of state property to private property that we're putting appropriate targets in there on every one of these projects so that we're creating some affordable housing every time, basically, you know, as much as we can, every time we turn a shovel, some portion of that is going to be affordable. Um, and that will go a long ways also to, to solving the problem. Thank you so much, Representative. Uh, this is a lot of, you know, like I like to say all the time, this is all good stuff. Um, it's excellent to hear all of the leadership and the work that it's getting done. Um, we have a few questions in the chat uh, for Christina, some comments for Wayne Niederhauser and also a question. So if anyone has questions for Representative Waldry, please let me know um, or for Wayne Niederhauser and we're gonna try to uh, get to the questions. Uh, Christina Nick Fritz, uh, which uh, he is with Intermountain Healthcare, had um, an initial question. How can mission-oriented investors, lenders, help stretch these two $50 million pools to maximize impact, assuming we get the money? <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully we get the, the uh, appropriations. Um, you know, we're going to be conducting a series of outreach uh, efforts, if you will, to, mm -hmm. to work with not only his group, but others to see how we can maximize it and pair it up with community dollars. That is the goal. This is the first time a pot of money like this for both, quite frankly, both sectors will be available. So it's not just going to be um, divvied out in a black box. We're going to have folks such as, uh, I see Peter Carone, former mm -hmm. mayor Peter Carone is on the line as well. He's in the yeah, affordable housing development sphere will be reaching out to individuals like himself and Wasatch Residential, as well as uh, nonprofits and financial institutions to truly create a plan to to expend these funds in the most um, in the in the most maxim the maximizing way. I'm not sure if that's even a word, but it can be today. <laughs> yes, it can be. Yeah. And, and, and I think, Francisca, let me just add to that, because this is mm -hmm. going to be something that we are going to have to work on. I don't think that we're going to have that solution in the legislative session that we're going to have a, you know, a ton of really strict definitions in there. I think that will come as a result of all of these discussions. And that's, you know, I think that's one of the goals that um, Christine and I've talked about is making sure that, you know, we get the money appropriate, we put it in the right sort of bucket. And then the rules to letting the money out of that bucket come from these discussions with the stakeholders instead of having it sort of just be a, 
blind top-down effort um, that sometimes we do in the legislature where we don't engage with others and we just sort of do what we think is best without uh, a whole lot of visibility into uh, the nonprofit sector and private developer sector. Right. One other thing I would just like to add is David Damshin with Utah Housing Corporation is revisiting the way that they grade, I like to say grade, <laughs> projects as well. And it's going to be more public and open process. Together with the Utah Housing Corporation, we'll be able to leverage, especially those tax credit project funds to their utmost extent. They also have a, um, a program where they're assisting in building single family homes. So nothing is uh, in rural Utah, so nothing's off the table. Bottom line is, however, however we can expend these dollars to the greatest extent to benefit the most is what we're gonna be tackling. Correctly. Thank you, Christina. And speaking of uh, Mayor uh, Karun, uh, Christina is typing her answer in the Q&A. Um, so I will let Christina do that. And I'm going to go back to the chat to see. Yes, there are some comments. I want to I want to make sure I get to everybody. Uh, Shelly Overt uh, has uh, some comments for you, Mr. Nina Hauser. Um, Basically, uh, she said, this is amazing when you just told my story. That's exactly the road I lived before and everything. And you are saying is everything that I feel so deeply in my heart. I'm so grateful to hear of this information and I'm so excited for everyone uh, to work together on a common goal. Uh, and like, I'd like to say Shelly is one of our new board members. So we're very happy to have her with us. Um, I reshared, um, the email from Mr. Niederhauser, so you can contact him directly. Um, Shelly has a question. Do you think setting up those wraparound services could look similar to how apartment complexes work currently, meaning the office be where this case workers will be available to these individuals on a regular basis, similar structure to what an office staff would provide to their residents? <clears throat> There's a lot of economics to that. Thank you, yeah. Shelley. Um, and dispersed housing, where we get a lot of these individuals spread around, you know, there's some really good things about that because then they can interact with healthy communities. <clears throat> but the challenge with it is now providing services on a dispersed, uh, uh, in a dispersed situation. Uh, because uh, then you've got a lot of travel time, case management services. Um, and so uh, some of these concentrated um, housing complexes where they're dedicated to um, uh, housing people that have been chronic, uh, that have experienced chronic homelessness, uh, there's some uh, economics to that, good economics, because, you know, we can have case management actually housed there. <clears throat> Might be some mental health services there or some uh, job services if it's large enough. We just can't quadruplicate and duplicate all those services to every little spot where there might be someone. And so those are some issues we still have to work out. <clears throat> and I think if we have coordinated entry, <clears throat> people that don't need as much case management that are more on the acute or uh, situational side uh, can be uh, dispersed more out through the community, might be uh, a, long, a longer uh, distance from transportation because they might have more opportunities for that, like a car. Um, uh, but those that are going to need those kind of services, especially the deep services, the intense services, are going to be need to be where close to where those services are and where we can economically provide those services. Thank you so much. Um, there have been some questions and answers in the chat between the panelists and attendee. I thank you so much for that. Um, Robert Vernon. Um, also USC board member and uh, the leader of the Provo City Housing Authority. With most of the money from homeless mitigation fund going to the Salt Lake City area, will the 125 million be allocated more equitably, sorry, hard word, to rural and other cities? 
The answer is that we are going to do, we want that to go statewide. This isn't just for Salt Lake County. And, you know, proportionally, you know, 40% uh, of the homeless situation is outside of Salt Lake County. And, and hopefully proportionally, we can get that money to, uh, to all parts of the state uh, because homelessness is a statewide issue. And that will be my objective. So that I appreciate that uh, comment. And this is a statewide issue and this is statewide money. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul Davis has a question. Is there any consideration of giving more teeth to enforcement for Utah Housing Authority? Currently really no penalty. I'm wondering if you're referring to the corporation, Paul? Or perhaps he's referring to the moderate income housing plan process? Yeah, Paul, if you want to raise your hand, I can um, have you ask the question directly if you want. Maybe, maybe Christina, we can answer the second one on the on the uh, uh, affordable housing plan. We are looking at um, options to put some teeth into the enforcement of the moderate income housing plan. That you know, the challenge to this point has been we just don't have we we don't get very good information. And so it's difficult to enforce penalties when there's not very good information presented. So this next um, uh, round, we will have much better information mandated and, and um, coming from the municipalities so that we will be able to, you know, there's already on the moderate income housing plan, there's penalties in place that have never been assessed. Um, and uh, so as we get better information, then I think we can look at encouraging strongly enforcement in those areas. Christine, is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. But... Yeah, and what we're, we're doing from a DWS perspective is we're going to be hiring a program manager for the oversight of this moderate income housing plan. The goal is to have this person um, uh, hold, the, hold more of a planning background, qualifications in, in planning as well as uh, some other some other aspects. So I will have that job description posted hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, we're moving away from more of the historical policy driven uh, role of the moderate income housing plan. That is what the Commission on Housing Affordability will be. What we will be moving forward with is providing more robust information to the Commission members and allowing uh, more transparency in what's happening from the moderate income housing plan, which has been lacking historically. The reason I asked the question was, is talking mostly about tax credit properties and when, when they change hands or when somebody's found in violation, the only thing they can be told is they're found in violation and cannot apply for tax credit again. And when properties have changed hands, it usually it's not even important to the new owners whether or not they're found in violation and the enforcement is really there's no there's no teeth in the enforcement they can't mm -hmm. find them they can't do anything to them for being found in violation and mm -hmm. and we also have problems with rent creep as soon as the the fair market housing rate goes up the rent goes up you know even though it should have they shouldn't be tied to each other they just see it as an opportunity to get more revenue so, Paul, uh, you're talking specifically about LIHTC funded housing. <laughs> right. That's, yeah. that's the biggest problem we have because we have about three or four large properties that that really, when we find them with a problem, we, there's nothing we can do. Right. And I would, that conversation, I think we should probably take offline and, and work with David Damshin and his office because, unfortunately, but that's not something I can answer. Yeah. yeah. And they don't have, when we talk to them at the summit, they don't have much authority to do much about it if they yeah. find somebody in violation. Yeah. There's, there's really not a lot of teeth in that law. Right, Paul, thank you so much for your question. I, <clears throat> I don't mean to be rude, but I wanna make sure we stay on time and there are other people who have uh, questions. So um, I will have Peggy ask her question to the group. Go ahead, Peggy, you can unmute yourself. I am sorry, I do not have a question. I don't know how 
uh, how this happened. Uh, in great conversation, let's go with the questions. Okay, so it's okay. It's Zoom. So, um, Let's see, uh, another comment from Ginny. As a case manager for Utah Independent Living Center, finding true ADA units for my clients is a real problem. Please keep them in mind while planning. Also was another uh, remark for somebody up in Ogden, the same comment regarding uh, people with disabilities who live on fixed incomes. Um, you know, they also need housing and we need to have them on our uh, radar. Um, it I just is, have a quick comment on that, Francis. Yeah. Uh, just for everybody on the call here, <clears throat> the ADA and disabilities is something um, you know, we really ha don't have a deep understanding about. <clears throat> just the, the policies surrounding and the requirements. I understand ADA, I mean, uh, the, the law, mm -hmm. but how, how do we fit uh, people with disabilities into this deeply affordable housing? Um, <clears throat> how are we gonna find that nexus uh, to help uh, this population? I think many of our people that are struggling with chronically, that are with chronic homelessness uh, are people with disabilities um, that have, um, uh, I, I see a lot of individuals uh, that you know, are in a wheelchair or, and I experience a lot of people that, you know, have some, some mental illness. And, and so I've wondered, you know, have they been designated as disabled? And so I, I, I ask people in this, in this arena uh, to please reach out to us. Um, you know, let, let's talk about how mm -hmm. uh, we can um, bring this uh, subpopulation into the discussion uh, um, because I, that needs to be part of the solution, no question in my mind. Um, and, and Francesca, we have a legislative um, housing <laughs> a conference today at noon. So okay. I'll thank you have so to much. Drop off at this yes. point. I, I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> I've got to go. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, the three of you. We really, really appreciate it. You can leave our meeting now. Uh, thanks good luck. You Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for everything uh, you do. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thank you. For the people in attendance, uh, I just want you to know that, um, you know, the legislative session starts Tuesday. As staff, we're going to be really busy. Uh, we're going to be working with our partners and um, will be very important this year to be even more proactive in your advocacy. I know Mary, many of you on this meeting today are active with your own legislators, but it's really, really important. Uh, you know, when you contact your legislator, please look at the area that you serve. Um, if you have any more questions for me about this, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to, to talk with you. We have the housing day on the hill, scheduled for February 9th. We have a room reserved at the Capitol. I don't know yet how everything will gonna look because COVID cases are exponentially increasing. I don't even want to say anymore. Maybe we're gonna do something virtual, but I'm gonna keep everybody posted. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for what you do in your community um, and uh, we'll be in touch. Have a wonderful day.